This week, a treat for you. The home movie of my wedding. Happiest day of my life. Preserved forever on this DVD. Oh no. If you think these fellas are forever, then, well, think again. This week, Click looks at how long your DVDs will actually last as we visit the labs that can speed up time. And if that valuable data suddenly becomes a liability, we'll also show you how to get rid of it in a hurry. Plus, we go old school and meet the folks who think those zeros and ones are overrated. All that plus the latest tech news, and we have a tall tale in a very short space in Webscape. Welcome to Click. I'm Spencer Kelly. By now, you probably have thousands of digital photos of family, friends, and holidays nestling on your computer. Precious memories that you never want to lose. Here's the reason I've been filling up my hard drive like never before over the last three weeks. The videos of him take up even more space. Now, if I wanted to keep these gigabytes of nostalgia safe for future generations, for instance, so I could embarrass him in front of his friends when he's older, you may think that archiving everything to some of these will preserve them forever. Well, you'd be wrong. Here's David Reed with these cautionary words. Why do we take so many pictures and shoot so much video of families and friends. Maybe we're convinced that our short lives will somehow be prolonged if we capture these fleeting moments forever. There's a problem, however, because French research has just found that fleeting and short is how best to describe the lives of CDs and DVDs, the very things that we trust these memories to. Nous avons été surpris de constater que la longévité, la durée de vie des... We were surprised to see that the lifetime of discs, some of which were designed to last for centuries, actually rarely lasted longer than five to ten years. In the most severe cases, which were happily quite rare, the data on some discs just lasted a year. Sont des disques enregistrables qui ne durent que un an. Although we're used to the idea of audio tapes and videos that wear out the more you play them, discs are read with a laser. There's no physical contact, so they don't actually wear at all. What does happen, however, is the surface that contains the more than seven miles of data deteriorates with age. And scientists can calculate the likely lifespan of a disc by artificially aging it with heat, water vapor and light. The problem for us is that scientists have found that the quality varies even across the same brand. In all the brands, even the brands you would call renowned, we found models which have problems. Disc production varies, and that means in the same brand you can find discs that are produced by different manufacturers, and that means their quality, how long they last, for example, is not necessarily the same. So the brand alone doesn't tell you if you've got something that's high or low quality. What's more, the manufacturer's eagerness to brand their discs can also make the data on them more vulnerable to corruption. If you look here, the swoosh and manufacturer's name is the only bit of the disc that hasn't been etched and the only bit of the disc that's not riddled with errors. The green, yellow and, most nasty, the red bits. And here the edge is looking a bit inflamed, suggesting the plastic sandwich of layers that make up the disc are coming unstuck, just like our data. So if DVDs and CDs live barely longer than most species of insect, what are our options? Well, I went to talk to some documentary makers because when you make a film, you produce a ton of footage, 1,500 gigabytes of HD for a 52-minute documentary, in fact, and all of it you have to keep. 
They keep their rushes in a safe with a combination lock and apart from hard drives also use the sort of cassettes that banks use to keep all their precious data secure. So how long does all this last? This is a big drama, this issue of how long these pictures will last. We don't know. The manufacturer says to us, yeah, five years, ten years, fifteen years. Great, thanks, mister. But we'll see in fifteen years, we'll see in twenty years, if it is still here, or if it's just become a pile of dust at the bottom of this cassette. We'll see if I can still use my images or whether my children, who could perhaps be film producers, will be able to use my images in HD. That I don't know. It's such a shame. Shame indeed. Digital technology allows us to take photos and accumulate video like there's no tomorrow. The problem is it's so difficult to store the stuff there could well be no tomorrow. We're destined to languish in a perpetual present. Except there are some things you can do. You have to be vigilant. Every two or three years, you have to copy your archive onto fresh disks. And after that, because these new disks will last just a little bit longer, you will have to recopy them after five or six years. What's important is not to have your information in a single place. You have to have your information in two places at least, on a hard disk, for example, and another hard disk or a recordable DVD or a CD. If you want your memories to last, then you have to get busy and spread them around a bit. It seems your digital archive is not just something you can dust off now and again and then put back on the shelf. Do that and your memories are going to get more than a little hazy. Sound advice from David Reed there. OK, now it's time to take a look at this week's big tech news stories. Facebook's founder has unveiled a new set of privacy options on the site after mounting privacy concerns raised by users and the US and EU authorities. Mark Zuckerberg admitted his company missed the mark by overcomplicating controls. But the real criticism has been over the wealth of personal details shared by default. While the new recommended settings still encourage quite a bit of sharing, there are now several one-click options to change that, and we'll have more on Facebook next week. A new social version of the BBC's iPlayer has been launched. iPlayer 3 is currently in beta, offering higher quality streaming, recommendations based on what you watch, and, here's the real innovation, links to Facebook and Twitter, so you can link friends directly to your favourite show. That's a click spelt with a C. Remember that, thank you. And talking of telly, Google has confirmed it's launching a TV service that it says unites live television and the web. The smart TV service allows people to search both live channels as well as content from websites such as YouTube. Special TV sets or normal TVs connected to a Google box will also allow people to access the wider web and download applications. The first TVs will be produced by Sony and available in the autumn. OK, so far we've shown you how to protect your data from the ravages of time, electrical surges or pure idiocy. But sometimes you may actually want to destroy your data. DVDs and hard drives containing sensitive information that you don't trust to the delete button. Well, we sent Clicks tipster Rob Freeman to the Information Security Expo in London to pick up some top tips on how to trash your bits. Want to make sure no one can access your data after you've thrown away the disk? Well, here are four mechanical solutions to a digital problem. First, for optical disks, the grinder. There's no way you're going to play that back. For hard disks, this beast is going to erase it just like in the films with an electromagnetic pulse. I think I might take a few steps away.
Unhappy with those magnets? In that case, just crush it. Stand by to crush. Oh, satisfactorily destroyed. And that felt good. Or we can run this over with a big truck. I'm joking. It's what's inside the truck that matters. Inside is an industrial shredder. It'll chew one of these up every minute. And here it is in six millimeter bits. And that's four mechanical ways to destroy your data. We've been looking at some of the perils of living in an increasingly digital world. That's strange. And of course there are those who hark back to the warm, fuzzy days of analogue, where you might listen to your favourite music on one of these. And if you had a slightly weak TV signal, you could still make out what was going on through the haze. Yeah, this digital revolution we're all living through seems to have kicked up a surprisingly strong analogue resistance. LJ Rich has been infiltrating the slightly wavy front line. Digital is better, or so we're told. While the thrill of progress permeates our modern existence, the sleek lines of today's lickable gadgets belie technology's dirty past. The roots of all consumer electronics lie in old-fashioned analogue, from audio and photography to computing. And if there was a place for analogue tech to hope to end its days, it would be under the care of Kevin Morell. He's the director of the National Museum of Computing, housing everything from Second World War computers to newer, old machines. I can move my arm through 90 degrees, and I can move that to any position I want in 90 degrees. And that's an analogue system, uh, and there are infinite number of steps I can take by doing that. If that was a digital system, and let's say it's just one and zero, I can either move it there or there. Well, if I have two bits, a two-bit system, I can move it from there to there to there. So the higher the number of bits, the higher the resolution, and that digital system is then approaching that sort of analogue representation. <laughs> For example, the more megapixels a digital camera has, the closer it is to representing real analogue life. Polaroid stopped production of its instant photography products in 2008, but the brand has recently bent to public demand and jumped back on the analogue bandwagon. So we, we're just in the process of launching what we call the Polaroid 300, and that is um, an instant camera that uses film. In hindsight, um, the former management team possibly made um, a slightly premature decision uh, based on just commercial decisions. You know, there was no doubt that the digital world was impacting upon um, instant photography. Shake it, shake, shake it, shake it. And the rise of digital cameras, complete with their instant results, coincided with Polaroid's eventual fall from grace at the hands of its previous owner. Yet such was the desire for expensive one-use film that an outfit called The Impossible Project bought Polaroid's European manufacturing plant and reverse-engineered instant film for an analogue-hungry audience. It's not going to be exactly the same chemical composition that was around back when Polaroid created instant in 1972 and, and the late 60s because some of those chemicals don't actually exist anymore. So Impossible are having to be very clever in terms of, I guess, reinventing the wheel to a degree. But what it means is that we will have uh, the classic 600 colour film that will go into your Polaroid One cameras that everybody has hidden away in the loft, the attic or a cupboard. Lots of us have techno junk just hanging about doing nothing. But a movement called steampunk breathes new life back into old kit. They reuse and recycle with a fond nod back to the days of analogue. Oh. Moving father's grave to build a sewer. A sewer! This band's latest song was released on a wax cylinder, which, by cutting a groove into the surface, is the 19th century predecessor to vinyl. To do it, they tracked down Adrian Tudnam, archivist extraordinaire. 
He was commissioned by the National Sound Archive to build this recorder to calibrate other wax cylinder machines. It took him about 18 months. It's accurate to seven thousandths of an inch and an essential part of it is a tin of spag bol. Yes, that's a spaghetti bolognese tin. It was just the right size that when filled with lead, it counterbalanced the other end of the machine. The flywheel is made from the handle of a steam valve out of a boiler house. The whole thing is driven by the motor out of an old BBC video recorder. He's been working on the thing for about 20 years and it's still not quite finished. But what does this analogue enthusiast make of digital recordings? Digital has made some very, very big changes to the recording technology. Um, the permanency, the lack of skill that you need in order to produce it. Um, you can produce perfect recordings at home, which would have been absolutely impossible in the most well-equipped studio 30 or 40 years ago. Having said that, you still need the skill of making sure that what those recordings are is good. And that, of course, is a, something that people have to learn. Analog is the real world. The real world is not digital, and even with the most modern and up-to-date digital equipment, there is still analogue at each end of it. You still have to sing into a microphone, you still have to listen to the sound through loudspeakers or headphones, so there is always a place for analogue. And we could be the ultimate analogue to digital converters. After all, our thoughts are made up of neurons, which are either fired or not. But these thoughts are trapped in an analogue interface, our bodies. Perhaps that's why analogue endures. Ooh, what a fascinating thought. Digital beings trapped in analogue bodies. She's quite a philosopher, that LJ, isn't she? Yeah, anyway, moving on. Now, cloud computing. It's all the rage these days, and there's no shortage of tools to help you store data and do work online. Well, next up, a lady who always has her head in the cloud. It's Kate Russell in Webscape. Thank you, sugar. You're welcome. No, not you, Spencer. I'm talking about SugarSync.com. Another great cloud storage service I've been trying out. With SugarSync, just set which files and folders you want to sync, and the software does the rest. So your data is always at your fingertips. Files are stored securely online, and you can remotely access them from any web-connected computer or smartphone. You can share your files with invited collaborators, and the software is much easier to set up than a home network, with drag-and-drop functionality giving it plenty of appeal to the novice user. One of my gripes with cloud storage is that any changes you make to a file usually mean the whole file being uploaded again. SugarSync has an incremental changes feature that works really well, which can drastically cut down on your data traffic, especially when working with huge files. Another impressive feature is the integrated file versioning, which automatically saves up to five previous versions of a file, so you don't have to keep multiple copies to restore from. And don't worry about filling up your allotted space, as only the most current version is counted in your online storage quota. You get two gigabyte for free unless you increase your capacity with referrals and there are several purchase options right up to 250 gig for professional users. One of my pet hates with the new touchscreen mobile phones is the virtual keyboard. My fingers are just too fat, so I'm loving thick buttons. This free app works on the same principle as predictive text, only it changes the size of the buttons on your keyboard depending on what you're trying to write genius. This app is such a joyful addition to my Android collection that I wondered if there was anything similar for the iPhone. Well, Apple are somewhat protective about their interface and you can't change the keyboard without breaking the terms of your warranty. The closest I could come up with was this. ShapeWriter is an interesting concept which lets you write in broad sweeps across the virtual keyboard instead of dainty little taps. Predictive programming assesses the movement of your finger and ascertains which word you're trying to write. It's available on Android too if you want to give it a go, but the problem for me here was that my finger got in the way of seeing the keyboard as I was sweeping broadly around. Funky idea, but utterly useless as a productivity aid if you don't know the QWERTY layout by heart. My search for keyboard aids did turn up another fun app for the iPhone, iType to Go. This free download lets you see the world through your camera's eye as you're typing away on the virtual keyboard. Why? Well, I'm not quite sure. I certainly wouldn't recommend composing an email as you walk along the high street, but it does look kind of cool. 
talking of cool, it's possible that the author of this next site could make use of iType to go whilst completing his tweets. Are you sitting comfortably? Then we shall begin. How about this for some pint sized drama? VeryShortStory.com is the home of Twitter fiction writer Sean Hill. This growing fad involves writing stories that will fit into a Twitter post. Follow at Very Short Story for a regular dose of intense fiction from a really talented writer who manages to do so much with just 140 characters. A date for your diaries now. This Sunday, 30th of May, is the launch date for Project Space Bits, a high altitude balloon which will be released in Portugal. There's a fun video on the site showing a test flight of the balloon and what we can expect on Sunday. If all goes according to plan, it'll fly to a height of around 30,000 metres before floating back to Earth on a parachute. And you can follow the whole trip on their website for about two hours on a live real-time web dashboard, complete with onboard instruments, an interactive map that moves accordingly, and apparently a few surprises. Can't wait. The Space Bits balloon will have a good view, but I doubt it'll be quite as good as NASA's Earth Observatory Gallery. Of particular interest here are the natural hazards images, which paint a somewhat serene and beautiful facade on some pretty devastating environmental disasters, like volcanic ash clouds coming from Iceland and this monstrously huge oil spill currently slicking its way out of the Gulf of Mexico. And that was Kate Russell. And you'll find all of Kate's links at our website, bbc.co.uk slash click, along with a video stream of this week's programme and a link to our sister programme on BBC World Service Radio. It's called Digital Planet, and it's very good. This week's programme reports from Chile on how computers and connectivity are returning to the area devastated by the earthquake three months ago. And there's also a report from the Afropixel Festival in Dakar. And please do get in touch whenever you feel like it. You can tweet at BBC Click or email click at bbc.co.uk. That's it for now, though. Thanks for watching, and we will see you next time.